Welcome to the SMB Community Podcast with hosts Amy Babinchek, James Kernan, and Carl Polichek. Produced by Kernan Consulting and for the international MSP community, we are dedicated to making every IT professional a successful IT professional. Welcome to the SMB Community Podcast. Hey, James, how are hello, you doing? Hello. We 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 have a special guest today. Well, he's not. He's sort of a guest, but he hasn't been here in a long time, and it's his birthday as we're recording this. Welcome, Carl Palachuk. Hey, thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Happy to be are you, here. Are you doing anything Welcome. fun for your birthday today? Uh, going to dinner. Going to dinner. I have dinners with friends. That's a, that's a great way to celebrate, celebrate it, your birthday when you get old. So. It is. I celebrated your birthday by sending you a Facebook post of photos of us doing fun things over the last, I'm not sure, at least 10 years. Uh, cough, cough years, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I, love, I love how Facebook pops up and will give you all sorts of funny photos from years past. So, uh, so I, I did the same thing this morning, Amy. So anyway, yeah. happy birthday, Carl. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. Facebook memories are my favorite feature of Facebook. Like putting a pin in it, like, oh, I want to remember this, so I'm going to put it on Facebook. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't yeah. thought about that. So yeah. I post everything, and then it doesn't know what uh, what's important. So. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we have some stuff to talk about today. Do you want to start with the question of the of the week, though, James? Yeah, yeah, we had uh, we had a great question that came in, and and thank you for sending in the great questions. We we're kind of backed up a little bit, and we typically will grab one of the best ones and talk about it. But this came in two weeks ago, but it was what is the best commission plan for salespeople? What is the best commission plan for salespeople? And I think it's more of an overall compensation. How do you pay salespeople? So, Carl, Amy, what are your thoughts on that great question? Well, I know that that you probably have a million thoughts on this because sales people and sales trainers and coaches always want to make this, I think they want, want to make this incredibly complicated. And I, I think the best plan is simple. That yes. is 10% yes. yes. of gross or 30% of net and no limits. And that's just the way it is. And the problem is I've seen it so many times in big corporations and little companies that at some point, the salesperson is earning so much money that they want to muck with it and make it more complicated. And everything they do that complicates it pays the salesperson less. So now they're less motivated. They sell less, blah, 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 you know. And so <laughs> it, uh, I, I think simple is, simple is best. Are you going to pay them forever? on those sales or just over a certain time period? So I, I don't want to pay them forever because at some point, if you pay them on all of the recurring payments, what happens is at some point they make an $150,000 a year. They spend all their time on the golf course and they never have to sell another thing as long as they live. All right, James, it's yeah. time for you. I actually know nothing about salesperson <laughs> uh, compensation because I chose never to hire one. So <laughs> not a, not a, not it's not a road that I had to go down, but I know this this is your jam. So educate yeah, us. This, this is this certainly is right up my alley. So first of all, Carl, agree hundred percent. Keep it simple. I constantly see super Mensa smart, highly technical CEOs make these complex comp plans, and if your sales reps don't understand it, they're not going to be motivated by it, and it's not going to work. So keep it simple. Number one. Uh, number two, Carl brought up another great point, and Amy, I'm sure you'll agree with this. You know, the fastest way to lose a great salesperson is muck with their commission plan. Put some brain power into it in the beginning, make it uh, motivating, and then leave it alone. You know, you need to monitor it, right? You know, and you can you can tweak it as you go, but um, just be careful with that. That that used to be a great recruiting opportunity for organizations that I was a part of when people would get their comp plans changed, you know, normally it was for the worst for them. So it's a great time to recruit people away from your competitors. But the reality is there's kind of two, uh, two parts of it. One is there's subscription services that you resell. And if you resell subscription services, which all of you should be doing, right, that's the 
primary objective, take your services, make it recurring, make it a subscription. So those typically you want to pay a percentage of the first month's numbers coming in. What I see, what's really, really common is you get 100% of the first month payment for, as a one lump sum, and then that's it. You, right. get, you get nothing else. So it's 100% on a, on a multi-year agreement and you could, uh, you know, do 75% of it or 50% of it or 150%. You can play with numbers, but I kind of like keeping it simple. It's one month um, upfront for the payment. And then all the other goods and services that you have, you would pay a, a, a percentage of the gross profit, you know, and hopefully all of you uh, have good books in place and you can keep track of the gross profit. But uh, the commission plan I grew up on in the industry was 25% of the gross profit. Everything I brought well, in, it was profit of the gross profit, 125% of the gross profit. So, you know, if I sold a hundred thousand dollars in gross profit that month, I got $25,000 and, you know, we sold lots of computers. We sold lots of project services, you know, big blocks of time or, or big projects uh, back in the olden days. Uh, that's how it was done. And then when subscription services came in, you add a modifier, just like we talked about, where you have a, uh, you know, you pay a, a high percentage of the first month payment as, you know, and that's really where the MSP business owner makes the most money. So, and that keeps salespeople motivated. So, I have a question though. Yeah. Why, why do we have to motivate salespeople by commission? Salespeople, the, the cultures that I always worked in were highly competitive. They were typically diff they were all wired very differently. You know, I'm I was wired as a salesperson. I started as a salesperson on the phone. You know, I'm a competitive athlete, you know, played college football, but I played sports my whole life. So when I went into the business world, it was it was a contest for me. Every day I wanted to keep track of how many calls I made, how many quotes I got how many new accounts, how many meetings, I would keep track of that. And those were the goals that the owner set for the team. We had a team huddle every single morning and he wanted 50 calls from everybody. And it was like, look, I'm not as smart as everybody else. I need to make a hundred calls. You know, I just overachieved, but uh, I thrived in that kind of environment just because of how I was programmed. Um, I, I have to say, I, I, I agree with Amy's thinking that, if I could rewind the clock, I would never yeah. hire a salesperson and, you know, uh, or I would, I would just pay them a salary and say, look, if you make this company as successful as possible, we will all thrive. And that includes you. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, if you think about buying a car, would you rather buy a car from a dealership that where they, the salesperson mm -hmm. gets a percentage or mm -hmm. where the salesperson gets a flat fee, you know, because yeah. I love the, uh, you know, the flat fee. Uh, what's it called? Especially CarMax, group. right? But actually, truth be told, the very first sales job I had in technology, I was on straight salary. You know, I I remember uh, my very first million dollar order way way back when. I sold a bunch of Everex servers to the Navy, and uh, one big project. It was over a million dollars, and it had over a hundred grand of profit. And I'm like, wow, I wonder if I'm going to get a bonus. You know, on top of that. I did it just because of personal pride. And back to Amy's point and Carl's point, I completely agree. It's two different trains of thought, but normally you do need some type of, for production employees. You know, I wanted, uh, normally if you want to motivate them to make more phone calls or make more quotes or drive more sales, typically you would want some kind of incentive program normally. But uh, anyway, my my first commission check was a, a check for a thousand dollars. You know, I made made the company over a hundred thousand dollars in profit on my million dollar order, and I I didn't know what to expect, so anything was good. I guess I was happy with it, but you know, I was like, wow, I got a commission check for a thousand dollars. Well, it's interesting because we always say don't focus on the money, right? Like in my sales process, I don't want anybody to talk about money till at least the third meeting. Right. Yeah. I, I resisted. I resisted very strongly. Um, but a salesperson paid on commission, it's going to be all about money. Like that's the one thing that they have in common with the client. And so yeah. that's where you get down the road yeah. of selling things that the company might not deliver 
or selling things at a loss or mm -hmm. all kinds of motivations other than what's in the client's best interest. Yeah. You, you guys are bringing up a really important point. And I think, I think I'm kind of a unique employee because I was paid straight salary and I worked with a bunch of friends and it was just pride. We were all just competing against ourselves to see who could be the best and just have bragging rights, you know, and that was the culture. It was fun, uh, happy go lucky, you know, great learning environment. I learned so much and still friends with these guys today, but, uh, you know, then when you move into commission environments, it gets very cutthroat, but at least I was strong enough, um, you know, to have, you know, integrity and be honest and so forth. The, uh, the important thing though, that you guys are bringing up, I think you, the business owners need to pay really close attention to your core values. You know, if, if your core values, uh, would be disrupted by bringing in, uh, commission salespeople, you know, there's a lot of really good salespeople that I recruited. I had the chance to hire and I said, no way, Jose, you know, no way you're not a fit for our company and our culture. You know, you don't want people like that. Um, so be, be careful because commission, you know, highly energetic commission salespeople can be very disruptive, uh, especially if you're new to this. Um, so be careful, but I have a couple templates. If anybody's interested in looking at some sample comp plans, uh, or what to track, you know, some KPIs or goals, I've got a couple documents. I'm happy to share. Just email me at james at kernanconsulting.com and I'll, I'll send those over. But, uh, yeah, the, the old, old fashioned way was a draw against commission. And then what's more common today is the base plus commission. And then we talked about the commission either as a percentage of the profit or a percentage of the first month of recurring revenue. So. There's also something you've said in the past too, that I think is really important here. And, the, and I remember you saying, don't hire a salesperson until you can hire two. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. that culture you're talking about and that like, you, if you just have one, who are they going to compete with? Right. Yes. If that's what your, that's what your, your goal for your, salespeople are to set up that environment in an environment of one doesn't really work out. Yep, exactly. And, and that first company that I was hired into, you know, there were four of us, you know, so I was constantly competing, you know, and there was always a gauge whether you were overachieving or underachieving because I could base my productivity based on everybody else in the room. But yeah, that's a really important point. You know, don't just hire one salesperson. Most of the MSP offices that I've been into, you know, there's some that look like a, a VCR repair shop that a bomb went off in, <laughs> uh, but most of them are dark, they're quiet, there's no noise, and there's really smart engineers just working on projects or programming, and that's it. And that's that's a death wish for a salesperson. A salesperson should be sitting on the other side of the building with lots of windows, lots of light, lots of noise. Um, you know, my, my sales floors always were really loud, almost looked like a stockbroker floor. I was walking around with pots of coffee, filling up everybody's coffee, high-fiving them, telling jokes. Putting uppers in their coffee. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Getting them fired up, you know, uh, but you know, we, we made it fun and, but those were the types of people that fit my culture and, and but like you Amy also said, have to monitor every little thing because Think about some of the worst customer service experiences, right? They come from salespeople who are going after a commission and, you know, doing doing things they shouldn't be doing. Wells Fargo is probably the, the biggest national example is that they they motivate people to do things, open up accounts, and and that's that's their KPI. And it, and all of the behavior that follows from that is bad for Wells Fargo. It's bad for the clients. It's, you know, right. it's bad for everybody except the salesperson. Um, and then we've also seen vendors who uh, they they compete with their partners, right? And until they literally get rid of their internal sales organization, yep. they will continually redo their partner program again and again and again for the rest of history. Um, but yeah. it will never work because their internal salespeople are competing with their partners. So yeah, they have a channel conflict. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, put some brain power into what you want to do and you know what the goals of the company are, and and then align the compensation or the bonus plan to um, uh, to encourage good behavior. 
you know, to get to those company goals. You know, it's a team. Remember, it's a team. It's not individuals. You you want a team culture. All right, guys, we have to talk about OpenAI. And OpenAI has been in the news for many, many good reasons. And today, as we're recording this, they're in the news for drama. The, <laughs> the drama, the soap opera that just happened over the weekend, because we record these on Mondays, is incredible. Uh, the board of OpenAI, which is a nonprofit, so OpenAI is a for-profit corporation that is governed by a nonprofit entity. Hmm. Um, the it's so because OpenAI started life as a nonprofit, right? And um, it had some people that left when it spun off a for-profit arm. One of those people that left was Elon Musk. Um, and they left because um, they were members of the effective altruism movement, which mm -hmm. says uh, they're very, very concerned about AI. Some people call them AI doomers, right? They think that AI has tremendous potential to do good and also tremendous potential to do evil and get out of control. Um, and if we don't keep a really tight thumb on that side of things, then it could get ugly. And so the board over the weekend fired uh, Sam Altman and the president of the company. They fired two people. The other guy isn't getting as much press. Um, and uh, said basically they haven't given a specific reason other than to say that they lost trust in his transparency in what he's been reporting to the board. And they felt they could no longer effectively manage the organization with him at the helm. Now, to add to that drama, one board member was not present and the decision was not unanimous. So, you know, typically when something of this magnitude is gonna be done, you wanna see the board, you know, as a whole making the decision, not somebody not being present for this important decision and uh, the board not being unanimous in it, right? It was like a, I think there's, I, I could be wrong here, but I think there was five people on the board and four people at the meeting and it was a three to one vote. Wow. So, um, so anyway, that happened. And then over the weekend, they were said to be in talks to bring him back to open oh. AI under new terms. And at the same time, he and the, uh, the other gentleman whose name I can't recall at the moment, were out promoting a new business that they intended to start together. Mm. And then the board rejected the, uh, the board reversed itself, I guess, and rejected his terms to return to the organization. At which point, within an hour, Microsoft hired hired them to head up a new independent entity within Microsoft to do AI research. So Microsoft is one of the primary investors in OpenAI. The biggest one. So now are they competing with them or are they looking to supplement them or we just don't know it? We don't even know at this point, right? Microsoft has released a ton of AI products through Copilot, right? And yeah. their Copilot's not a one thing. Copilot is many, there are many Copilots, right? There's Copilots for all their different applications and services. That is 100% dependent on OpenAI, right? Microsoft does all of the back backend hosting of the large language model and the and the, provides all of the CPU power to make that happen, which is hugely expensive. Mm -hmm. but they don't they don't own it right open ai owns it so there's a huge dependency that microsoft had on open ai um they may not have that for long yeah yeah that leverage sounds like it's going to disappear real quick so add just to add a little bit more to the drama uh <laughs> sam altman was in discussions with a number of investors to buy out the shares of the 700 employees that work there. 
to the tune of $80 billion. Wow. wow. That deal will probably fall through now. How many employees? 700. Wow. <clears throat> That's a pretty good take home. One more yeah. drama item. 500 of those employees immediately created a letter and sent to the new entity at Microsoft saying they would like to join them. Oh. <laughs> this like has no end of dramas happening. So and I'm not sure that this isn't exciting. a mini series you're asking <laughs> for Netflix and uh, you know people producer. <laughs> People at Netflix are busy writing the <laughs> writing it down right now, and it'll probably be out soon. I mean, this uh, it's 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 dramatic. Um, so they did appoint a new permanent uh, a permanent person, and it's a guy that used to run Twitch. Um, who's going to be the new president over there and running things? So we'll see what happens. And he's more on the altruistic side. Um, Sam well, Altman's no. gone the for profit, let's make as much money as we can, move fast, break things, create yeah. AIs, uh, bent. And I think it really sounds like these board members wanted to slow things down and make sure that what they're producing is going to be an ethical AI that does good for the world. So interesting. I, I have to say that <clears throat> finding people who are talented and experienced, especially programmers in AI, is very, very, very difficult. So if Microsoft could suddenly get 500 of them, they would. Yeah, they, yeah and they might, but do they have an ethical dilemma being the largest investor in that company? I don't know. Um, and wow, and yeah, would... apparently OpenAI is pretty much has a, a large stranglehold on the number of great developers in, in AI. Right. But they have competitors in Copilot and Bard and a couple other startups, but um, you know they're the they've been the heavy hitters, and it may have just imploded. Time will tell, mm -hmm. but it's I I think it's going to be hard for them to come back from this. Now yeah. I haven't looked at at LinkedIn today, but every time some major thing is going on at Microsoft or most other tech companies, LinkedIn is full of people who are like, hey, can you send me a uh, an endorsement and <laughs> all this kind yeah. of stuff. <laughs> so uh, there's usually <laughs> evidence of something going on on LinkedIn. So yeah, I don't think anybody anticipated this. So. You know, it said Microsoft as the largest investor found out one minute before the the deed was done, and the other investors found out on social media. Wow, I, I do have to say. Using the term altruism and Musk in the same sentence just doesn't feel quite right to me. So, <laughs> well, you know, and, and then to me, the obvious, can you say lawsuit? You know, it's uh, it, this will all end up in litigation and get pretty, you know, just add more to the drama part of this, right? I'm not Maybe. sure who's going to sue who. Maybe the employees for the board's action costing them potentially a lot of money and, uh, stock buyouts i don't know yeah. well the other piece of it that wasn't explicit is microsoft could withdraw their funding if they're going to compete internally and you know open ai has revenue but it's microscopic compared to the 80 billion dollar so-called valuation right so uh, yeah. that's all money that has been you know quote unquote donated it's been supplied by somebody else who wants to get the benefits. Uh, so uh, it'll be interesting. And it, what's weird is this moved so fast. A year ago, like November 2022, uh, people couldn't spell AI, right? And now <laughs> it's everywhere. And uh, it's interesting because this is the kind of shenanigans that happened in 1999 and 2000. And there was a collapse of the so-called you know, internet bubble um, so who knows what's going to happen with open AI? I don't think we're going to see that kind of collapse, but, uh, a bunch of, a bunch of money flooding in and then a whole bunch of confusion, uh, is a great opportunity to make profit. So, yeah. Well, Microsoft's, um, stock was erratic over the weekend as this was all unfolding because everybody knows about their dependency on open AI. And then they hired and stock shot up again so 
they said, you know, the biggest winner in this whole thing is probably Microsoft. Apparently this new AI division is going to be independent. So it's not a new department within Microsoft, it's a new little entity. Hmm. I imagine they had to pay some big dollars <laughs> in the salaries for the, those for those two guys. What was the name of the uh, what was the name of the technology company in the movie Terminator, the original Terminator? They have but, our Schwarzenegger as a spokesperson. Our you know our our military is putting together a Skynet, which is you know, speaking of Elon Musk, it's thousands upon thousands of the Starlink satellites, all designed to protect our military communication systems. Yeah. And, uh, and talk about a dependence, right? <laughs> Microsoft had a dependence on OpenAI. Our government has a dependence on Elon Musk, which is mm -hmm. which is enormous. I just finished reading a book about living in the space station for a year, which was great. Uh, and I'm sending it to you, Carl. It's on its way. It's in the box. So thank you. Um, but they, but you know, reading that, one of the things I learned is when we grounded the. Um, the space shuttle, right, determined that they'd reached their lifespan and wouldn't be safe to fly them anymore. What we did was create for ourselves a dependency on Russia, because Russia has done all of our NASA flying from that point forward, until Elon Musk came along. And now we're funding him to do all the stuff through SpaceX, creating a different kind of dependency, but still a really outsized dependency on one company, in this case, one individual. So just the other night, uh, two nights ago, um, my daughter and I were meeting up to, to do a celebration. And she said that, and this was literally like 6 p.m. And she said, we were driving here and we saw what we think might be a UFO. And she looked up <laughs> yeah. and there was this line and she counted them, 21 white dots in the sky, all moving in unison. And so I explained to her that's e Elon's satellites. Well, and Starlink. It's, it's oh. uh, you can you can literally go to a website and look up <laughs> when you can see Starlink in your place. And so she looks it up, and it was like five fifty seven on this day, and then five fifty five the next day, and five whatever forty eight the next day, and you know um, exactly where to look in the sky, but she videotaped it and it was shockingly clear because they're like 350 miles up. They're not that far up, but right. it also means, you know, to thinking about Skynet and, uh, you know, old sci-fi movies, uh, disrupting that is a matter of blowing up something in that orbit. And as it goes around the world, it'll just take out one satellite after another, and there's currently 5,000 satellites, I think, that Elon mm -hmm. has put up. Uh, so, and, wow. and the goal, I think, is 12. So he's not done yet. Uh, oh, no, the goal of our the goal of our military, I think, is something in the neighborhood of 80,000. Yeah. And the, one of the problems is that brightness that you talked about. So um, uh, they've committed to reducing the reflective surface of those because it, it it's interrupting um, astronomers from being able to just oh, yeah. see with yeah. telescopes out there because these things are brighter than the stars in the sky. Right. It caught, Plus, it caught if you me were, by surprise. If you were an alien, I mean, where are you going to hide? You're going to hide in the middle <laughs> of all of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I've been taking pictures of the Aurora Borealis and I get them in my, in my you know, pictures. I get this streak of white dots going across. Yeah. Did you hear about the uh, the toolbox that uh, one of the astronauts on the International Space Station got back, you know, did a, a an exterior walk and then came back in and she had left her toolbox outside. So if you go and Google, where is the, where can I see the space, the International Space Station, there's an app for that. Uh, and then you look, you find it and then look just in front of where it's going and you'll see the toolbox, which is super, super bright, brighter than the space station so <laughs> yeah yep i read about the yes the, the 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 toolbox orbiting the sky and the toolbox will fall to earth at some point yeah, yeah. it's uh so you're only going to be able to actually see that for a limited time because it's it falls out of 
falls right. out of orbit as it as it goes. Right. So. And hey, we had another. Oh, actually, I've got kind of some fun trivial pursuit here. Are you guys ready to play a little oh, trivial okay. pursuit in the MSP oh. channel? Oh man, <laughs> spring this on us. Go ahead. No, not ready. Yeah, for so, this. so yeah. everybody knows ransomware is on the rise, right? Ransomware is on the rise. But what industry has the most attacks? There's a couple obvious ones, but think it's, about it. It's what not, industry? It's not IT. <laughs> yeah. Well, IT was <clears throat> one of the. The suspect ones. Medical? I would say finance, like uh, uh, accountants and um, enrolled agents. Money, yeah, money. I, I'm going to go with I, medical. Yeah, I was going to guess government, right? You know, a lot of government. It seems like every city known to mankind is getting well, that's true. Now. So it's not IT, it's not government, but it's healthcare. So Amy, Amy wins. Woohoo! <laughs> All right. You know why that is? Because. Healthcare professionals are loath to invest in security. We've tried yes. to make them do it with, longer than anybody else. We have been longer than yes, HIP, HIPAA, which was completely ineffective. Although it's done something for privacy, but it's done nothing for for IT security. It does have mentions in there, yeah. But but yeah, no, they're just they're such easy targets. Yeah, and it, and if you don't believe us, just email your doctor at doctor at gmail dot com. Exactly. <laughs> That's where you find all your, most, your private information. <laughs> find all your most uh, all your most qualified doctors at gmail.com right next to the CEO uh, seo.gmail.com. We used to have a client that they their their method of communication was to constantly add more and more people to the string until an email string had literally 50 employees on it. And so Manny when Manny worked for me when he had to reply to one of these long strings, right in the middle, he would add an email address of everyone at gmail.com or <laughs> everyone at google.com. And, uh, and nobody ever caught it except me. But <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> we are done for today. Thank you for listening to another great SMB community podcast. And thank you for joining us today, Carl. It was great to see you. Thank you very much. And happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving indeed.